Hello, my name is Brendan Ozawa De Silva. And I'm Michael Carlin, and we are the Associate Directors of the Center for Compassion, Integrity, and Secular Ethics at Life University. Thank you for joining us for this presentation. This presentation is about what we call the second seismic shift. As you'll recall from the last presentation, the first seismic shift was a fundamental shift in the way we understood human nature. From this kind of depiction of human nature as dog-eat-dog dog or every man for himself, survival of the fittest, to one where actually compassion, kindness, forgiveness are the core of who we are and talking about the fact that we are driven to cooperate and to give care and to receive care to be the most healthy both individually and as a culture. So that was the first seismic shift. The problem, however, is that our compassion can be very limited and very irrational. So for example, we tend to have a much more compassion for people who are close to us, for our family members, for our friends, uh, for what we would call our in-group than we do for strangers and people we would consider enemies. And uh, this is supported by research that shows that when people are exposed to oxytocin, their sense of care and compassion increases for their loved ones. But at the same time, it also increases their sense of an out-group and um, their antipathy and anger towards an outgroup. And this tends to make sense because as we increase our compassion for those that are close to us, we also want to protect them and we want to make sure that they're free from suffering. So that uh, drives us to try to look at others as enemies and uh, be on guard for protecting them. So it's very easy for us, even if we are driven by compassion, to create these kinds of categories of us and them and to really reify those categories. And when those categories are then uh, filtered into culture and our educational system and other things, it creates implicit bias. So here is an example of one study that is showing the results of the implicit association test where individuals are shown a screen such as this where they are repeatedly shown faces of um, either African American or European American faces in this case and are shown good and bad words and are having to um, associate the words with the faces that they're seeing in a randomized way and the test is measuring both correct and incorrect answers but it's also measuring the latency in how long it takes somebody to actually click the correct button. And so that way, even if somebody is able to get all of the answers correct, the test can measure how long it takes for the person to figure out if they want to associate a good word with an African-American face, for example. And that latency indicates a kind of implicit bias. And these tests are done not just for African Americans or, or, and European Americans, so looking at issues of race, but any kind of in-group, out-groups that could be created, whether they're gender-based, religion-based, ethnic-based, and others. And consistently, these tests show that people do, in varying degrees, hold implicit biases that they're not aware of. That, uh, that could be driving a lot of their behavior and that, again, although we have compassion at our core, it tends to be limited in the way that it's delivered and the way we see the world. And this can have um, potentially really catastrophic effects. Um, as you can see here, another version of this test shows um, images of individuals that are either holding uh, some sort of tool or a weapon and people are supposed to try to figure out as quickly as possible whether or not what they're looking at is somebody holding a weapon or holding just some sort of tool and what we see is that blacks are 
much more often assumed to be holding a weapon than a white person. And, you know, this can clearly have serious consequences when um, somebody is seeing somebody and they immediately assume that they're threatening or they more often than not assume that they're threatening if they're holding something that might actually be quite harmless. And so these implicit associations have repercussions clearly in the real world. And so understanding how we can break down this bias and break down this kind of uneven way in which we deliver care and love and compassion is really important for our future. Another way that our compassion is quite irrational is, uh, and it was discussed in this piece in the New York Times about the arithmetic of compassion, is that oftentimes if we see one person suffering, then we are really moved to act. But if we see a lot of people suffering, we feel less compassion. We feel on some level perhaps overwhelmed. So here is an example of a study that talked about how um, we have what's called compassion fade. So how we give more charity to if we see a single child in need versus seeing an overwhelming problem or masses of people in need. And this certainly would explain uh, the kinds of advertisements we see for organizations like Feed the Children and others where they know well that that one individual who is suffering is going to pull on our heartstrings or, or really speak to our compassion and our empathy in a much more strong way than if they show masses of people who are suffering. Now, clearly this doesn't make any sense. It, it's irrational that we would have less compassion the more people we see suffering, but it's how we respond. That's why when an image such as this appears in social media and in the news, people immediately want to do something about the Syrian refugee crisis and they want to mobilize and feel they need to do something as opposed to seeing an image like this, for example, where you have thousands of people who are suffering and dying and yet we somehow feel less compassion. So again, our compassion is irrational and um, it doesn't necessarily extend in a logical way in the, to people that need it the most. And that brings us to the second seismic shift because if all we had was a very limited and irrational capacity for compassion and care, that would be a, a nice new way of looking at human beings. Um, it would be a nice way of looking at other primates and mammals. Um, but it wouldn't help us figure out how we could expand this compassion and care in order to um, make it more rational, make it less biased, and less focused on our own in-group. This second seismic shift is the discovery and general acceptance of neurogenesis and neuroplasticity. It used to be a common belief that there was a very short window of time for the brain to develop neural pathways and that actually um, at around the age of 20, one's ability to change the structure of the brain and create neural pathways dropped off dramatically. Um, and then at around the age of 40, the brain stopped changing at all. And there was no ability to create no new neural pathways. When cells died, they were never replaced. And with the new theories of neurogenesis and neuroplasticity, we have found that throughout one's life, new neural pathways are being created and new neural cells are being generated. And that this takes place throughout one's life and has a tremendous capacity to change uh, our innate abilities. And that we can, with practice, it actually change the way we see the world and we can actually expand on 
the kinds of, of fundamental capacities that we already possess so that ultimately things like compassion and empathy can be extended beyond our limited boundaries and beyond our irrational ways of, of extending them. Here we have a great example of a study that was conducted that illustrates what we have with neuroplasticity. So um, in London, anybody who wants to earn their license to become a cab driver has to memorize the entire street map of London. They have to commit it to memory. And this process typically takes three to four years to actually go through. And at first they scanned the brains of London cabbies and found that their hippocampi, the area of the brain responsible for memory, um, were larger, had actually thicker gray matter than normal control subjects, so people who were not cabbies. And so the, um, the suggestion was that actually memorizing these maps increased the cortical thickness of the hippocampi. Now, the other possibility was that people who had better memory and larger hippocampi were just more likely to become London cabbies. So they ran another study. And in this study, what they ended up being able to do was to set up a control group. And they took people who were in the process of studying or just beginning the process of learning how to be cab drivers in London, and they scanned them. And over the three to four year process of them learning the map and memorizing the map, they could show that the group that ultimately passed the test ended up with thicker gray matter at the Cape of Camp I than those cabbies that had been studying for the test but ultimately had failed the test and far thicker than a control group that had not been studying at all. So in this study, they were able to show that the process of memorization, the process of going through the practice of learning this map, actually changed the structure of the brain and increased the gray matter of the brain. So this is a very exciting finding and one that is just one of many of now thousands of these kinds of findings. So with this second seismic shift, this shift into understanding more about the way that our innate capacities can be cultivated, can grow, that these skills can be trained, there is optimism that the limited amount of compassion and empathy and care that we're born with uh, that tends to be irrational, illogical, and very limited can actually be expanded through practice and one of the primary ways that we believe that can happen is through contemplative practice and things such as meditation. As this graph shows, meditation research has been rapidly increasing over the last 20 years. Um, and as you can see, just in the last five years alone, uh, the number of studies has almost doubled so that we are currently on pace um, to really exponentially increase the amount of data that we have about the effects of different kinds of contemplative practices through various different fields such as psychology, uh, neuroscience, developmental psychology, and the growing field of just contemplative science itself. Now with this incredible rise in the amount of studies that are being conducted, we are gaining a great deal of knowledge about various practices and the kinds of outcomes that they produce. At the same time, however, there's also the danger of the effects of meditation and other contemplative practices being overblown. And we find that this uh, is the case when the effects of meditation begin to get picked up by the popular press. So it's not uh, unlikely that you will see meditation or mindfulness gracing the cover of various different magazine covers. If you do a search for meditation on Amazon, you're going to get 
somewhere over 17,000 results. Now, clearly, that's not every one of those is not an individual publication, but I think it's heuristically helpful that there are this many results for that one term, uh, and that has certainly grown in the come, last few years. And then, of course, all of the books that have uh, come of that same uh, phenomena. And, uh, of course, one of my favorites of why mindfulness is better than chocolate. And then there is lots of hype going on on the Internet where you have, for example, this recent article from the Huffington Post talking about what meditation can do for your mind, body, and spirit. And in there was this graph that basically talks about how it can really improve every element of your life. And while some of this is certainly true, a lot of it has been uh, overhyped, and a lot of it has been used for maybe not the most ethical of means. So, for example, there was this article in Bloomberg Markets suggesting that the way to make a killing on Wall Street is to start meditating. And as a result of all this, uh, as Fortune magazine recently wrote about, meditation has become a billion-dollar business uh, and is being picked up by Fortune 500 companies. Uh, Google is a very uh, prominent example of a company that is using meditation uh, throughout the company uh, and others. So there's a tremendous risk of this all being overhyped and getting way out in front of what we actually know. And it's not just big business and the media that have some of the responsibility for overhyping the results. Uh, in this recent article in The American Psychologist, uh, two of the pioneers of the field of contemplative science, Richie Davidson and Alfred Kasniak, uh, wrote a corrective to the research community um, asking them to really consider the kinds of methodological problems and conceptual issues that are evident within the research um, as in many cases. And so uh, this article uh, really spoke to um, how we need to do a better job uh, within the research community of conceptualizing what we mean by mindfulness, what we mean by meditation, what we mean by contemplative practice in general, as well as making sure that we have uh, the right methodologies and the discipline within the experimental design so that the research can be more reliable. So the first thing uh, with all of this research is to really make sure that we understand what we're looking at. And then the second thing is, how do we take this research and look at the ways that these practices can engender more ethical behavior and, um, and it not be used just for simply making more money, uh, having a better sex life, and things of that nature? In short, how do we separate the wheat from the chaff? And in our next video, we're going to be doing just that when we do come back to trying to really understand the empirical basis for compassion, where we will be presenting uh, some of this research and trying to help tease it apart and um, get into what we know, what we don't know, and how this might be able to inform us as we move forward in trying to bring ethical practices into business. Thanks for watching this presentation by the Center for Compassion, Integrity, and Secular Ethics at Life University. For more information, visit our website at www.life.edu slash ccise or email us at compassion at life.edu. Thank you.